Hello, and welcome once again to the Ray of Discovery series. Revelation directs its rays through many portals. A poetic verse, a fragment of music, a lovely metaphor, a penetrating image. These can each become the doorway of unexpected new revelation. Have you ever been so touched by a casually received impression that the very ordinary suddenly becomes the extraordinary? Why Tesla's developments were so very mystifying and thrilling in his day is comprehended only by seeing and feeling some image of the world which surrounded and permeated his being. By knowing the surroundings which suffused him, we gain insight into Tesla's temperament, taste, and creative direction. In these two episodes, we will touch the essence of Nikola Tesla through the atmosphere in which his futuristic technologies were both conceived and developed. It is my sincere hope that these real images and scenes from New York City will excite and refresh simple aspects of Tesla's biography, which may have become vague and lackluster with years of repetition. Much of Tesla's habitual surroundings yet remain. When he arrived in Manhattan, it was a place yet untouched by his genius. Fashionable new brownstones such as these, luxurious parks and gardens, broad tree-lined avenues, all pointed away from the congested downtown area in directions north toward lush, endless green forests. It was a rare time, elegant, quaint, not yet metropolitan. The year was 1884. The simple portfolio which he held walking the streets contained the secrets of a fundamental power revolution which would soon permeate the very dreams of North America. This was a time poised between strokes and chimes of a delicate clock, ticking into a future which dreamers, like Nikola Tesla, were spinning from visionary fabric. His mind stimulated to new dreams, his eyes filled with the gleaming world of sky-vaunting crystal towers, sharp beacons of white light, and wonderful flying machines. The metropolis of the future was his secret world. Into space, then, into the space of mind and heart, the dream space from which all wonders emerge. Tesla dreamed in colors, his visionary experiences having been the substance from which each of his astounding discoveries and designs were drawn. The placid space, a thesaurus from which emerged new and wondrous realities, was his familiar geography. One cannot help noticing that Tesla instinctively sought locations which evoked new vision. Vistas and open spaces were a reminder of his homeland. And now, as if from a dream, we find ourselves walking in Tesla's own footsteps. His long walks, more like odysseys in the late afternoon, led him among the new brownstones and the floral splendor of the Victorian New York City, which he came to love. Himself for a time the very center of technological change, Tesla literally witnessed the transformation of Manhattan from quaint brownstones to large buildings of iron. Tesla arrived in America with introductory letters which brought him into the employ of Thomas Edison. The Edison DC power system, whose continual breakdowns were far too demanding for Edison himself to attend, required a highly trained individual. That individual was Nikola Tesla. 
Edison became infuriated when Tesla suggested developing a more efficient electrical system. Edison retorted that a fortune would be personally given to him if he could design for Edison a better DC generator. Tesla immediately set to work on developing DC generators for Edison. He presented these drawings and blueprints in person, expecting to be equally met with legal documents and royalties as promised. Edison took these designs and implemented them without the promised reward. This incident forced his departure from Edison in 1885. With monies given him by financiers attracted to his work, Tesla established his first private research laboratory among these very iron buildings on Grand Street. Here, Tesla developed arc lamps and arc lighting systems in an attempt to gain the personal independence needed to sustain his love for pure research. This first small private venture collapsed after unscrupulous investors, while helping themselves to first profits, managed to leave Tesla penniless. Once again, Nikola Tesla walked to the gray streets of the industrial New York neighborhoods, sustained and encouraged by an unfailing reserve of visions and dreams of the future, was not enough, however. Having run out of options and openings, and at the mercy of daily necessity, Tesla was forced to find a more immediate kind of work. Tesla dug ditches, laid cables, and set cobblestones. A truly ironic twist, these excessive labors were performed at minimum wage for his old employer, Edison. Tesla was forced to live in cheap rooming houses, growing more and more poverty-stricken with each swing of his pickaxe. It was an intolerable time for him. Edison's power and light company was filling the city with direct current, most probably generated by the very machines which Tesla had designed. Tesla's incessant talks on polyphase so impressed the foreman of his digging crew that a meeting with certain promoters was arranged. After hearing of the polyphase design, A.K. Brown, an outspoken opponent of Tesla's direct current system, came to speak with Tesla. Before rising out of the ditch in which he was found, Tesla demanded a financial stipend, a complete machine shop, and a research laboratory of his own. He was, in an instant, pulled up out of this first nightmare. Thereafter, Tesla developed and patented scores of polyphase designs and working models. Through a joint venture with George Westinghouse, Tesla became a multi-millionaire literally overnight, propelling him into an incredible future one which seemed unlimited with promise and possibilities. On what is now called West Broadway, Tesla opened his most famous and most magnificent laboratory. These numerous building exteriors, now an artistic haven, give a fair sense of the overall setting in which this second research laboratory stood. Large first and second floor galleries served as both reception and demonstration areas, while several upper floors provided wonderful workspaces for machinists, small assembly lines, and a host of related scientific researches. Then, ever so much more than we see now, South Fifth Avenue was an elegant fashion district, ablaze with light and high society where coaches and trolleys followed each other in long stately processions. It was a setting into which Tesla brought a bizarre atmosphere of mystery. The fashionable street where luxurious gowns, elegant jewels, and tinkling crystal lamps glittered among the window panes of shops and restaurants was interrupted by a mercurial messenger of the future. The Tesla Research Laboratory 
which the bronze plaque declared at 3335 South Fifth Avenue. Here was a magic shop. Into this shop came those seeking the future. However notable and erudite, each newcomer was never disappointed. Tesla always had some incredible scientific achievement to demonstrate for his mystified audience. It was in the South Fifth Avenue laboratory that Tesla entertained notable personages of highest social stature. Dinners held in Tesla's huge lower gallery halls were brought by coach from his favorite restaurant at fabulous expense. This was a time period filled with nobility and grace, fame and fortune. Tesla learned to live and dress in great luxury. However often he was reminded of his time digging ditches, Tesla winced and instinctively moved toward excessive luxury. Tesla's own private coachman daily conveyed him along the South Fifth Avenue cobblestones downtown to Delmonico's. Once surrounded in gardens and fountains, coachmen helped exclusive patrons to a long flower-lined walkway covered in an equally long canopied entrance. The one-time epitome of elegance and charm, Delmonico's brownstone exterior is now dwarfed by defiant towers of steel. Delmonico's remains, a sadly forgotten fragment of the last century's lost charms. Through windows and doorways, now hazy with time, we glimpse ornate reception lobbies once flooded with the pleasant music of string quartets and of chandeliered dining halls once filled with society's notables. But not far from Tesla's own dinner table, one of Edison's obsolescent DC power stations yet sputtered away. Edison's dynamo halls were a strange combination of engineering laboratory, research facility, machine shop, supply terminal, public display, and business office, all brought together under a single roof in characteristic Edisonian fashion. Edison and Tesla, the two electrical knights, were carefully watched from a distance by a tightly knit group of financiers. Caring little about the technology itself or its importance for humanity at large, these old family dynasties prepared their moves when once it became apparent who the victor would be. Tesla's polyphase sword forced Edison to yield. Technology was providing new avenues of social power. John Pierpont Morgan had early realized the worth of science and technology in creating profit. He collected and traded inventors and their inventions like so many playing cards. There were plenty to be found. It was a time curiously filled with these kinds of intelligent groundlings. One by one, Morgan erased the dreamers which he collected while squeezing out liquid gold from their dreams. Thomas Edison was one such unfortunate victim. Morgan's rulership of his company forced the once boyish Edison to produce far beyond his own very human limits of endurance. When Edison failed to produce the noteworthy inventions which characterized the wondrous days of his youth, Morgan abandoned him completely. The sad, once great inventor became a venomous and embittered shadow when once Morgan had purchased him mind and soul. Morgan dropped Edison as he had done with so many others, dropped him in favor of Tesla 
and of polyphase. The technological revolution envisioned by Tesla in so many dreams spawned an industrial explosion which transformed Manhattan Island. From a densely populated three-mile concentration, the modern metropolis burst skyward in towers of iron and stone. With this structural rise, financial dynasties of unprecedented wealth rose, all chiefly engineered by Tesla's polyphase. Polyphase ran the Otis elevators, which made skyscrapers possible. Polyphase ran the trolleys, which brought in the workforce to drive the office mills of the ruthless. Polyphase illuminated the dark towers and the darkened streets below. More than any other single commodity, Polyphase made these financial wheels turn in huge profits, just as Tesla had foreseen. It was good for Tesla to have tasted unemployment in America, Though he recoiled at the very thought of poverty, he soon discovered a renewed love for suffering humanity. He had discovered that inescapable corporate tentacles were everywhere, gripping and drowning ordinary working class Americans who were supposedly endowed with the rights to compete in business with no fear of reprisals from the powerful. It became at once clear to him that the working class who both generate technology's supply and purchase technology's fruit on demand were being regulated into fixed social positions. He would do his best to proliferate the spiritual equality of first American principles, principles founded by the pilgrims long before the arrival of their Puritan persecutors. Tesla was the latest featured attraction of the New York upper class whose bored and mediocre mind state needed the constant stimulations of such excitement. Inventors and other working class individuals of the Industrial Revolution would provide an exciting new entertainment. But Morgan was possessed of other excesses. Domination was his entertaining lust. Seeking entry into the AC industries with a classless, avaricious vengeance. On the social surface, all remained serene for Tesla, a pleasant pool. Tesla was now the darling of the uptown social classes, the envy of New York City investors. Speculators were intent on riding the Tesla magic carpet to riches. But the circulating streams of Tesla's life had become as complex as the polyphase currents circulating in his generators. Now Morgan intent on buying the entire technology of polyphase, sent attaches directly to Tesla himself. Tesla repeatedly and politely rejected Morgan's now insistent gestures, reminding him that he, too, was a multimillionaire. Morgan warned Tesla that his resistance would prove fatal. Returning to Tesla after a time, Morgan informed Tesla that he had succeeded in monopolizing the industries which produced power lines and cable. Without him now, there would be no way for Tesla to export electrical power to his customers. Tesla calmly informed Morgan that a means had already been found to eliminate the need for power line technology, and Morgan laughed at what he believed was a simple whimpering bluff. Finally, Tesla was infuriated. His dream of flooding the world with light, comfort, and equality would not be stopped by pseudo-aristocratic thugs. The truth was that Tesla had already made an accidental observation, which completely separated him from polyphase and conventional electric science forever. The year was 1891. The abrupt interruption of a high-voltage DC arc was felt by Tesla as a stinging shock though several feet from the working system. He examined this phenomenon with greatest interest. Electrostatically induced rays were found to be the cause. The light-like rays were strong and penetrating, possessed of mysterious characteristics. Joseph Henry first observed these rays in 1842. Elihu Thompson later accidentally generated them in 1872. These piercing rays differed from the weak electromagnetic waves 
which Maxwell had predicted. Heinrich Hertz had not generated them. Tesla conceived of a system by which electrical power could be broadcast directly through the air, one which required no power lines at all. Accepting an invitation by Sir William Crookes to address the Royal Society of London, Tesla demonstrated this phenomena in 1892. The new and astounding discovery of electrical rays sped throughout the financial world. Upon hearing of these announcements through technological advisors, Morgan was outraged. His large investments in the technology of power lines had been eradicated in a single stroke of Teslian genius. Having returned from his triumphant European lecture tour, Tesla undertook the construction of special new generators and large transformers. These produced the non-alternating impulses capable of radiating electric rays through space. Tesla's new announced broadcast power system would ruin Morgan's monopolistic plans. This rare examination of interior spaces near the South Fifth Avenue laboratory reveals the scale in which Tesla conducted this research, a scale now considered gargantuan to all but military researchers. What began as a gentleman's duel would end in disaster for Tesla. Tesla now found himself in a network of Morgan's shadowy intrigues. Morgan's audacious forays were further complicated by the steely tenacity of his own daughter Anne, who refused to depart from pursuing Tesla at every turn. Anne Morgan's brooding fascination with the dark millionaire grew into passions and obsessions, which later proved deadly. Tesla had been known to work through the early morning hours in upper laboratory floors. Was it only chance one night which led him out of the building to enjoy an early and prolonged dinner at Delmonico's? Shortly after midnight on March the 13th, 1895, Tesla was interrupted at 2.30 a.m. by his frantic technical assistant, Mangito. The wonderful South Fifth Avenue laboratory was on fire. Explosion after explosion rocked the fashionable district as laboratory floors fell one upon another. The entire structure was reduced to a smoking amalgam in a short time, the obvious work of hired saboteurs. Tesla stood alone and for a time devastated. The fire, a foiled death attempt, had consumed everything of value which he had cherished. The entire armada comprising his ray technology had been wiped away in an instant. Most of his money had been placed in this new technology. Tesla wandered off shortly after sunrise amid the swirling ashes and could not be located by worried friends or associates for days. Fire burns dross. Untold transformations took place in his mind and heart. Tesla returned with a firm resolve to establish a new and subversive regime of power, one which would effectively burn away all memory of his own polyphase technology. With what funds he had yet retained, Tesla announced the opening of his third great laboratory at 46 East Houston Street, this the probable site. Morgan was shocked to hear that he was still alive. Tesla publicly requested funds from Morgan, quote, that great visionary financier, unquote. Morgan, fearing public accusations of involvement in the laboratory fire, publicly yielded a sizable sum to Tesla. Tesla's reprisals would be far more complete than Morgan could ever imagine. His worldwide plan would rock the financial world in ways it could not yet appreciate. Electric ray technology was completely new, an alien thing to those of his own time period. Tesla made numerous press releases concerning his newest perspectives on ray power and ray power transmission. Performed in these halls, each demonstration proved his world revolutionizing concepts in power technology. Impulse ray beams, wirelessly ran motors, heated rooms, and flooded lamps with brilliant light a feat which Sir Oliver Lodge was never able to achieve with high-frequency harmonic alternations. Impulses were the key, a fact which his academic rivals had failed to recognize. Tesla played the American dynastic beasts, their government servants, the academicians, and the press 
with the finesse of a master. When he permitted a social interlude from his labors, he was drawn only to very select members of the more cultured New York social scene. No longer fascinated by the superficial opulence of the Fashion 400, Tesla remained among those families with whom he could share something of his mind and hopes, his dreams and desires. Ever seeking his escapes from the now congested South Fifth Avenue metropolis, Tesla found rest and inspiration only among the northernmost city estates. His dreams envisioned a world of flying machines and glowing towers, transcontinental travel, and limitless free power. These once Metro North row houses were the backdrop of Tesla's friendships, dreams, achievements, and social meetings. Their gardens and forested roads led away in twisting paths toward the northern hills and mountains which he loved. These homes are yet filled with a deep and numinous atmosphere, a lingering reminder of the warm people who once graced them. There had been a long romantic interlude which completely occupied and comforted much of Tesla's lonely existence. It was a sad and distant love affair, intensely complicated by the fact that the woman he dearly loved was the wife of his friend Robert Johnson. Their affectionate handwritten salutations were once passed by private couriers up to eight times daily between the two, an excess even for those Victorian times. Tesla resolved to put this affair away, bringing the entire romance to an abrupt and devastating halt for Catherine. He now withdrew from frivolity with an uncharacteristic and necessary callousness. He wished to lead an unfettered life, one whose sole purpose would be to bring about a long-awaited world-mind revolution. A more structured European pose now permeated his being. It was a resolve which later became an obsessive demand and a social impediment. Tesla knew that Morgan failed to recognize the power which men such as Edison and himself concentrated. The visions, the dreams, the ideas, these were the first source of power, the metaphysical secret behind the physical technologies. The metropolis was again growing to the north. It was a renewed interest in space, skyward space, which drove him away from the old city center. It was time to move onward, northward. Hotels. Tesla loved hotels. A tower penthouse was his goal. A new and fashionable style of hotel and apartment complexes was springing up all along Fifth Avenue as the avenue moved north. Hoping to merit a place in the famed Waldorf Astoria, he was compelled to choose several less merited hotels with care. A permanent apartment in the Waldorf would grant him access to the more adventurous and youthful financiers which began to emerge. Visibility was the key. Maintaining his distance from the Edison conglomerate at 65 Fifth Avenue, he chose his habitations with the care of a spy. Here in the northern city reaches of that time were new windows on the future. Here was a measure of both security, comfort, seclusion, serenity, and peace. This brick edifice was the place he avoided, the Edison conglomerate. Although he never lacked for company, Tesla chose new seclusions. There was a steady supply of socialites intrigued with meeting him. On this he could rely in times of inner desperation, a desperation which he veiled in a myriad of ways. All were naive to this game, save the one who continued to love him and seek him out. Catherine pleaded that he respond to her more overt and prolific messages, but he did not. Visions. He collected and cherished only the visions of his worldwide system now. 
Visions could not be destroyed by fire, time, or sorrow. Visions would not die, like his love unrequited. Visions once received would grow into the world like strong tree roots. On his long daily walks through quiet, brownstone-lined streets such as these, his mind once again opened in future visions. Flying platforms, aerial ships, luxury ocean liners, undersea vessels, towers reaching the clouds, signal beacons between the planets, healing rays, all the wonders which his broadcast power system would achieve for belabored humanity on a worldwide basis. The century was turning, and his world had now turned. Ever withdrawn into north metropolitan forested seclusions, Tesla began setting his sights on the new world which his visions revealed. Here and now was space, unlimited space, and all the potentials which space afforded. space into which his dreams and visions could find paths to wander, grow, entwine, and bear fruit. Here was time. Yes, above all, here was time. The serenity of the Swan Lake was interrupted by the machinations of a stranger who navigated tub-shaped boats through its foggy waters in the late afternoons. His tall, bedecked appearance, surmounted by the inimical top hat, was poised before a podium-like control device. From it protruded a glass globe filled with a smooth white light. At his commands, the submersible boat rippled effortlessly through the smooth waters remote-controlled boats before the turn of the century. Rarely described by Tesla's biographers are his experiments in Central Park. They form the heart of Teslian research in electrical power transmission. Tesla used the lakes and grounds of what is now Manhattan Central Park for his first large-scale experiments in broadcast power. Ground connections, water connections, open meadows, and open skies unlimited space within reach of his own laboratory. He could not have hoped for a more perfect circumstance. Tesla's portable transmitters and receivers were delivered from his Houston Street laboratory and set up in these north fields and meadows. His high voltage interrupters were energized by petrol driven generators. Balloons were sent aloft, carrying high voltage impulses into clouds. He conducted many of these experiments at night Tesla and his assistants watched as the continually expanding sheaths of white corona covered his aerials. Described in wireless power transmission patents, Tesla speaks of coronas which continually expand until their radiance floods an area with visible light.
Tesla scouted out city Northlands, where he could safely perform his new energy transmission experiments. Nathan Stubblefield once conducted his vocal radio transmissions in these very same rocky meadows. Tesla observed interactions of his transmitters with weather patterns, dispersing thick fog. Morgan had underestimated the power of Tesla's genius in developing monopoly destabilizing technologies. Through these patent armadas, Tesla continually delivered the hard message of defeat to Morgan. In 1897, Tesla gave a series of lectures at the New York Academy of Sciences, not far from this location. Few New York academes could follow what they later referred to as Tesla's convoluted and fragmented speech on impulses and rays. He was always aware that his audience included analysts who worked on behalf of financiers like Morgan, and he always enjoyed toying with their minds. In certain periodicals, Tesla announced that he had observed anomalous energy effects in his demonstration spaces. He found it possible to draw usable power from his demonstration space up to an hour after his transmitters had been deactivated. These anomalous effects were especially powerful when his transformers were grounded. Tesla discovered strangely increased power outputs when the ground applied impulses were of both fixed polarity and tempo. Quick applications of high voltage impulses resulted in extraordinarily long lasting discharges, an effect which suggested that electrical power could be withdrawn from the very earth. If true, this discovery could liberate humanity from its dependence on the fuel cartels. He was positively enthralled. This energy could be obtained anywhere, everywhere. He would imitate nature. The release of lightning was initiated by a single groundward stroke. The resulting uprush of current lasted for longer time periods, a leakage of extra power from the subterranean reservoir. He too would stimulate the earth with special and quick impulses, deriving greater energy from the uprushing currents. The device would effectively act as a huge pump, priming the underground reserves of absorbed electrical energy. For here was evidence of an energy reservoir one which found its probable source in sunlight. But what was it in sunlight that the Earth absorbed? Was it purely electrical energy or something much more rare? Furthermore, if lightning in its vast power was simply a leakage of excess power, what sort of vast reserves lay in deeper ground strata? Tesla's new dreams began to take defined shape. His new power broadcast system required extensive and expensive experiments. These would necessarily have to be conducted at safe distances from every city. He pitched his proposals toward the New York investors once again, publicly requesting funding from J.P. Morgan. Morgan hating both the public eye and Tesla's possible reprisals again complied. It was a small price to pay for his own peace. But how long could he allow Tesla to achieve against his own cartels? Tesla continued to calmly play this hand until the elder Morgan's death. It was a blackmail based on Morgan's first offense. With monies obtained through Morgan and others, Tesla established himself in the Waldorf Astoria. It was a fait accompli. The entire affair was luscious, a delightful and fitting tactic for an assassination victim who actually survived. Morgan was afraid of Tesla's reprisal and kept his distance. The strangling hold which threatened his dreams of illuminating the world was seemingly broken. 
For a time there was luxury, a rare joke at Morgan's expense. Tesla's penthouse placed him above the world, near the stars, from which poured infinite energies. It was with these energies that he would be principally concerned for several decades. His new sky tower gave him the comfort which in recent years he felt he lacked. Tesla knew that he had to work fast. He prepared himself for the task at hand. Tesla was well aware that Morgan would send him assistance to both assess his progress and determine his own weaknesses and those of his systems. Tesla, therefore, refused to speak with anyone during this time period except those press agents for whom he had special announcements. Tesla had only two effects on those who heard him. One group clung to his every statement. The others hated him. Tesla began to become secretive and mysterious concerning his new endeavors. Not one technical analyst could have imagined that Tesla was already designing geoelectric power systems. Tesla insisted that the true test of a fact is its demonstration, not the jargon of discreditors and slanderers. Above all things, Tesla said, truth beareth away the victory. Tesla planned his experiment in world engineering very carefully, often spending days of deep study in the Manhattan Public Library. Tesla worked out every feature of his proposed experimental station. It was to be a tower-like structure set on a mountain plateau preferably based in bedrock. The earth, he discovered, was constantly supplied with a local electrical pressure source. That source was the sun itself, whose constant electrical discharges supplied the ground with power at high voltage. This power was not in a previously usable form, arriving as a penetrating etheric gas and not as an electrical charge. Cosmic ray particles, as he first used the term, became electrical only after sufficient collisions with the atmosphere. Tesla inferred the possibility of tapping this energy source directly. Through his periodic interviews, he described what he was planning to do, announcing for the first time that his experimental station would be established in Colorado Springs. There he would apply high voltage impulses directly to the ground, causing an uprush of geoetheric energy, as he now called it. The resultant upwelling currents would later be handled through special components whose function it was to rebroadcast the derived energy in a more usable form. Energy such as this could light the hallways of the world forever. Tesla further stated that, should the upwelling currents reach a critical state, it might not be possible to stop the mounting reaction. He expressed fear that such a growing lightning channel would reach the ionosphere in a very short time burning the atmosphere away in a massive expanding vortex. He warned that no one should ever attempt the experiment without careful study of the processes involved, processes which required excessive and elaborate theoretical planning. Most thought him mad. A journey from New York City to the West could not be a light undertaking. Every detail had to be pre-planned with careful discretion. He always resorted to Bryant Park here after his extensive study periods, the large cultivated garden which lay behind the library. Here Tesla would relax with his portfolio in hand in the late afternoon sunlight. The famed Professor Dmitri Mendeleev had recently published several articles on the etheric gas, which he described in chemical terms Utilizing his own periodic table, Mendeleev claimed the existence of a zero group, ultralight elements preceding hydrogen and having the nature of inert gases. Mendeleev proposed that the ether is actually a mixture of several pre-hydrogen gases, a rich atmosphere produced by stars and by the sun, and which filled all of interstellar space. Our own local ether source, the sun, delivered sufficient pressure to supply all our energy needs for eternity. Necessarily flooding our world, ether gas would be most easily absorbed and concentrated in the ground. Ultra gaseous, highly permeative, and non chemical in its nature, the electrical atmosphere filled all terrestrial matter and yet was not detectable by ordinary means. 
the Son, a messenger of divine revelation once again. The solar ether would magnify any applied etheric impulse. Growing in strength with time, a whisper would quickly become thunder. Impulses, like the nerve works of a tremendous organism. Could he convert the planet into one immense communicating web? Innumerable connection points, like a neural network of infinite capacity. He saw the flashing impulses, speeding their messages through the ground, between stations, between cities, between nations. Here was an uncommon light above solar brightness. It was not mere superficial illumination, but something closer to the light of the mind, the light of consciousness itself. Could he transmit thoughts or visions directly through the world? Any device which employed etheric energy such as this would supply limitless power to the world forever, as long as the sun endured. Machines might become semi-conscious, responding to human willpower directly. Months passed. Tesla had already completed his experimental work in Colorado Springs, the mammoth station whose exact purpose no one could yet ascertain would soon be demolished by predetermined plan. That morning in 1900, courier service delivered a large package from Tesla with the bold script to Commodore Morgan, written across the broad label. Advisors were quickly summoned to the Morgan mansion. The enclosed note stated that, after finishing up affairs out west, Tesla would be arriving in a few days by rail. Morgan sat with intent gaze as analysts and advisors carefully examined the piles of photographs which Tesla had sent. In local press interviews, Tesla stated that he engaged geoetheric energies with astounding results, but the examiners were baffled. Beyond the sheer size of the photographed spark discharges, nothing seemed extraordinary. All they were able to assess was that Tesla had flooded the ground with current and, in keeping with known electrical laws, measured an expectable slight rise in output. Morgan went to the window and looked out, distracted. He listened, but could not inwardly rest concerning the strange man and these seemingly harmless photographs. Morgan sensed that there was a cryptic aspect a confrontational reply which eluded all of his learned advisors. In this matter, none could help Morgan. They examined and re-examined the photographs for hours, but could find nothing really significant to cause concern. But this was his manner, Morgan exclaimed, his damned secretive manner. Morgan knew he was being duped again by a far more piercing intellect than he had ever engaged before. Morgan burned the midnight lamp, seeking some means to obtain Tesla's exact purposes without directly confronting him. But what was his purpose? Why had he built this experimental station? Morgan believed that he had simply managed to keep Tesla occupied with trifles, while he himself was fast at work engulfing every aspect of Tesla's polyphase and polyphase systems. But now here, not one of his science advisors could discover the truth which Tesla had found, nor the directions towards which he was headed. The arrival of Tesla was courteous and warm. The men shared whiskey and spoke of the future while reading each other with cool panache. Tesla asked for a grant to establish his first magnifying station in Long Island. Speaking his outlandish and unscientific jargon, it seemed clear that Tesla would not pose a viable financial threat to anyone in the future. Morgan was convinced. Tesla had indeed lost his mind. And the minor expenditure of monies were all well spent in Colorado Springs after all. Distracting Tesla was profitable. Why not grant him another stipend? 
As far as Morgan and his staff were concerned, Tesla was off building fantasies. Tesla called the land where he built his first formal transmitting station, Wardenclyffe. The simple brick housing did not require much time to complete. Transformers, dynamos, and motors arrived from Westinghouse. Furnaces, boilers, forges, lathes, cable, laboratory equipment, and office supplies were appropriately installed. Tesla literally emptied his Houston Street laboratory and moved its entire contents to Wardenclyffe Station in 1901. All his personal scientific artifacts were stored in the closets and display cases of the Wardenclyffe Gallery Rooms, items which included some of his original models and designs. Months were spent scouring the underground tunnels and pounding in the underground pipeworks which formed his ground connections. A central shaft of 120 foot depth was lined with a spiral staircase surrounding the contact clutch through which both rhythmic impulses and resultant geoetheric discharges were to be conveyed. According to Tesla, this was the most detailed and difficult part of the entire construction job. The strange-looking support tower went up last. However closely Morgan's technical spies approached and befriended Tesla, none could ever find the strange and mystifying secret of the device being built. Tesla continually modified the capacity aerial structure surmounting the tower, changing the form from an original toroid to domes of various volumes. An ovoid was constructed whose rolled edges covered the outer perimeter. In order to prevent power loss through streamer discharges, Tesla wished to stipple these forms with tiny superficial hemispheres. Tesla actually desired the suppression of spark displays. It becomes apparent that while Tesla's applied impulses enter the ground, the resultant etheric streams move through the entire device upward and outward. Spark discharges would be a loss of power. Many analysts imagine the magnifying transmitter to be a purely electrical device. Few comprehend that Tesla applied high voltage electrostatic impulses only to achieve flowing interactions with ground concentrated ether. The resultant discharges were not completely electrical. He later designed a series of large vacuum globes whose function was to replace the intended metal hemispheres. The vacuum globes sustained far greater extremes of high voltage than the metal shells alone. Workers later reported the surprising inner articulate structure of the aerial capacity terminal. A spiked discharge ball was poised within a large copper sphere. This sphere was connected to the outermost capacity surface. We learn that this outer surface covered with special single terminal vacuum globes served a double function of suppressing spark discharges and projecting etheric power. The whole device resembles the compound eye of an insect. The magnifying transmitter drew energy from the ground itself, pre-electric ether gas under intense pressure. One brief close of the switch and an equally quick opening brought a barrage of white fire discharges lasting for nearly half an hour. This then was the wonderful secret of the magnifying transmitter. Tesla had found that the strong sudden electrical stresses of his impulse transmitters vented ground-absorbed ether in collimated jets. This geoetheric energy was ether gas under great pressure, being pushed outward from the capacity terminal with tremendous gaseous force. Etheric energy became electrical only after sufficient bombardments with matter, producing the brilliant white colorations. Tesla revealed the intended final form of his magnifying transmitter in a series of diagrams. Many of the worldwide applications of this world broadcast system being conceptualized. 
Tesla described how trains, cars, trucks, omnibuses, planes, dirigibles, and transoceanic liners could simply absorb etheric energy through the air. The diagrams which Tesla approved reveal the atypical feature of etheric discharges, which dynamically interact with their absorptive receivers. By bending into the receivers, ether streams evidence organic qualities unlike electricity. The numerous searchlight beams are etheric power threads which connect the land-based magnifier with ether absorptive crafts. Tesla also described a protective ray whose operation against invaders is pictured. In addition, one sees the flying crafts which Tesla is said to have tested, crafts which employ etheric power to levitate. Tesla described the tractive and repulsive effects of ether beams which were projected through high vacuum discharge bulbs. Such beams have been reproduced by engineer Eric Dollard and are electrically neutral in space transit until striking material obstructions where they become electrostatic charges. In patents devoted to radiant transmission from vacuum tubes, we glimpse the possible lifting drive which made these crafts realities. In each of these diagrams, Tesla showed how it would be possible to illuminate the night sky over the seas, the bright white light making sea travel safe. While Tesla planned to cause the air at sea to phosphoresce, ordinary illumination could be obtained through wireless globes, which Tesla holds in his celebrated series of photographs. The radiant emissions from these globes had noteworthy therapeutic effects. In addition, these lamps evidence a defined effect on human perception. Tesla observed mirage-like perceptual distortions all around his experimental station in Colorado. These effects lingered long after the system had been deactivated. These phenomena propelled Tesla into new research on the relationship between etheric energy and consciousness itself. Space-flowing etheric impulses could raise vitality, lifting heavy moods and restoring a refreshed mind state. His world broadcast system would transmit far more than usable power. Equipped with a knowledge of etheric impulses and their permeating effects on human consciousness, Tesla planned to deliberately increase human energy, the energy of human consciousness itself. This was Tesla's chief reason for building Wardenclyffe. This was his ultimate reprisal. Had he discovered the means for triggering an uncontrolled consciousness by the application of specific rhythmic impulses? Ether-raised consciousness would prompt world mind revolution at ungraspable foundations. No power on earth could stop a world of people having raised consciousness. Tesla planned the constant transmission of mind-elevating impulses while covering the real operation of his system with talk of wireless telephonic exchange. It is curious that just two weeks before Wardenclyffe saw its premier debut, Morgan cut the sizable funds which he had already invested in the project. Having been informed of these psychotronic plans, Morgan entered the arena in full belching fury. Morgan arranged the complete destruction of the Wardenclyffe station. Having organized his own polyphase monopoly, he fully intended on now breaking every Tesla patent with new designs. Charles Steinmetz, a genius no doubt, but an agent in the Morgan employ, formed the core of General Electric. The plot was simple. Find out the workings of Teslian technology, unravel the principles, and exploit the weaknesses. The very first task which Steinmetz was given examined impulses, oscillations, and alternations. Tesla technology. There were those who opposed Tesla at every turn now. Yet certain trusted friends remained. John Hammond was one researcher whose wealth was always at Tesla's disposal. Tesla remained a guest in Hammond's castle for several months. Together, the two men developed remote control technology for military applications. Tesla always spoke with great feeling of this time period and of the collaboration. Dr. Hammond always inquired after Tesla 
especially when the elder Tesla had not communicated with him for a time. Managing his own now meager resources with small consultant jobs, Nikola Tesla was forced to work for mere wages once again. A photograph taken at the opening of Marconi's New Brunswick VLF station is telling. The face of Tesla says it all. Pain. Anger. Outrage. Deprivation. Strain. Sadness. Tesla had found an incredible truth concerning power and consciousness. A dangerous truth. Tesla had indeed found the very force from which Morgan recoiled, the ability to engineer the elevation of consciousness on a worldwide scale was a frightening prospect for Morgan, who depended on the darkness of minds for his achievements. Morgan had engineered a nightmare for Tesla, a nightmare of hotels and trunks, of unpaid bills and damaging press releases. Pushed back, it was one from which he could never recover, or so Morgan hoped. Tesla was pushed into the darkness which Morgan inhabited. Pushed back into oblivion and darkness. Tesla was forgotten. Tesla was excluded. Tesla was eradicated. Can the truth be made to appear as a lie? Court proceedings, obviously swayed by Morgan, declared Marconi the father of radio. Can the sun appear a shadow? Academes derided Tesla, claiming that he had achieved nothing. Can knowledge, like sunlight glowing on a window pane, be made so ambiguous, vague, distant, and distorted that it ultimately appears unreal? No, insisted Tesla. Sunlight dispels shadows. Consciousness persists. Consciousness penetrates thick clouds. Tesla was nearly destitute, but for the intervention of dear friends and the divine providence in which he had come to believe. Of this time, Tesla later honestly spoke, declaring that hardship and deprivations alone forge integrity and true character. Morgan died in 1913. Tesla at least was still alive. He had outlived his persecutor. Perhaps now there would be a sunrise which might lift him from his sorrows. In photographs taken from this time period, we see him in his laboratory office, just across the street from the Manhattan Library. Having resolved to achieve his intended world mind revolution, Tesla turned his mind on the perfection of small devices capable of delivering large-scale effects. He designed and manufactured medical diathermy devices, a solid income source. During this time, Tesla busied himself with a diverse regimen of study, public relations, project design, and construction, all the while maintaining his dignified posture and poise. In his top-floor gallery at 8 West 40th Street, Tesla conducted experiments and gave demonstrations of his new devices. There were those who slandered him as an embittered, eccentric, callous, and reclusive man. He was not. Warm, friendly, cordial, sociable, and humorous, there were only rare times when he could not be disturbed. The visions which played before his eyes could not be disturbed until he had absorbed their meaning. Furthermore, each of his newest scientific claims were based on new experimental demonstrations witnessed by numerous individuals. Tesla daily walked through Manhattan as he had done all through his years. Miles of walking and thinking, walking with visions in his eyes. The city had changed since his younger days, days before his sad experiences with ruthless men. But here again were opportune times. There were those who recognized the tall, thin man in his long blue coat cane in hand, walking briskly along the windswept Fifth Avenue on crisp spring mornings. The sunlight again on his face, Tesla emerged from shadow to light, changed only in his friendly approach to people. Young admirers from his native land 
often too shy to speak with him directly, would attempt following him for blocks, often unable to keep up with his rapid and vigorous pace. In his top floor gallery at 8 West 40th Street, Tesla conducted experiments and gave demonstrations of new devices. He eventually moved all of his experimental apparatus to a penthouse in the New Yorker Hotel, a fact which has long remained absent from all his biographies. There he secretly conducted experiments. Tesla found that the disbelief of others could now work in his favor. Who would come to assassinate him now? His antagonists were all dead. He never ceased from his work, although the press pictured him as a lost soul. The time was again ripe for ideas to take root. A new breed of young and adventurous financiers were also emerging. At the height of the Depression, the Rockefellers built an immense arcade of skyscrapers whose principal function was to serve their new communications industry RCA. Tesla felt that the large fountain of Prometheus was an apt symbol to see each day. Like Prometheus, Tesla had stolen fire from the etheric spaces, offered its light to humanity. Instead, he was exiled, chained to a rock, and tormented until released. The Marconi radio systems on which the young Rockefellers had based their industry was, as he had correctly predicted half a century before, thoroughly plagued with weaknesses and inherent flaws. While he could not manage the complete revision of these systems, he would apply his touch to make the system work with a precision formerly unknown. Radio laboratories, offices, broadcast facilities, studios, and theaters all were arranged and organized around their version of Tesla's first conception, the world broadcast system. While NBC was not an etheric system, neither a broadcast system capable of directly communicating elevated consciousness and intelligence, nevertheless, it served as a reminder of Tesla's first attempts. Radio engineers of any worth thrilled to Tesla's former exploits, along with the young financiers who were thrilled to meet him personally. More than this, they needed his genius once again. The radio city, which Tesla had foreseen half a century before, was infinitely more personal and permeating than anything being developed at RCA Global. Tesla's radio city was a metropolis in which consciousness was stimulated and intelligence, thought itself, shared through etheric means. Tesla had long discussed the development of his own projective television system, one in which images were derived from and sent directly to the retina by special rays. Meanwhile, he endured the folly of those who ignorantly pursued Marconi wave radio and all of its inherent weaknesses. Long ago, Tesla had recognized a greater power in etheric impulses. Like Mercury, the winged messenger of ancient mythology, a special light had messaged its revelations to Tesla, who in turn sped off to share his visions with the world. Striding with visionary wings above the seething terrestrial waters, Tesla desired to give struggling humanity what he himself was fortunate to experience, healing visions and exhilarated minds. Tesla walked daily to the lovely and serene St. Patrick's Cathedral, where he enjoyed the peaceful serenity of quiet meditations. Tesla fed pigeons here, received fresh visions, and wrote profusely. He left 50 trunks of complete scientific manuscripts, works never before seen. The floral arrangements, which flooded the otherwise stony avenue with color and warmth, were always his favorite attraction. Lessons learned in younger days from the writings of Goethe. Tesla observed the growth characteristics of flowers, noting the similarities between his own etheric rays and life forms. 
The castle of the mind was an interior reality of the external world, into which sunlight and vision must flow. Tesla was familiar with inner darkness, times when his brilliant visionary experiences seemed distant. Through the years, Tesla learned to cultivate this gift, honoring the light which it represented far above his own desires. Visions were, after all, like flowers growing in the light. Enthralled with the unexpected appearance of this visionary light, Tesla often could not and would not speak with others who interrupted him. The visions were the soon-to-become realities which Tesla responsibly constructed, the cathedrals in which minds would grow and know of life. Tesla carried worlds in his heart and on his shoulders. He was only disappointed and pained when humanity shrugged the burden which vision commanded. I come here to think, so he once told a young admirer who found him walking through the huge Grand Central Station. His eyes were no longer piercing. They were magnetic and gentle. He sensed and thrilled to the times once again, for here was living action. Here was vision and excitement. Here was vital communication. Society had actually manifested the mind-elevating exercise which he had stimulated so long ago. The world had flickered in time from depression up into heightened awareness. The world had transmuted from ornate to sleek. There exists a permeating mystery in the last years of Nikola Tesla's life. The obscurity into which Morgan had him plunged left its mark on Tesla. Yet he emerged in later years with adequate financial funds to begin new research, research which few mention in their biographies. The New Yorker Hotel was the fashionable New West Side Art Deco Hotel. It was an expensive place to live. How then did Tesla come to own two penthouses there? One was his living quarter, a large and adequately comfortable house. The other was later found by a curiosity seeker, a complete radio research laboratory. In light of recent discoveries, we know each of Tesla's statements were the result of real demonstrations. Tesla never stopped building and experimenting. He moved from the gigantic to the miniature with ease. Numerous parcels were continually brought to Tesla from unknown sources. Tesla's nephew reported observing a small and portable etheric energy device. It is apparent that Tesla had perfected several kinds of these devices, intending to unleash these on society. These would trigger his world mind revolution, an unstoppable swarm. Just one week before an appointment with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Nikola Tesla peacefully and serenely passed away in his sleep on January the 7th, 1943. In his latter years, Tesla had developed psychotronic and radionic devices, systems which military groups were eager to obtain. The proof was the radionic instrument left in the Hotel New Yorker vault, a modified ten-dial capacitance tuner which was found. Wherever there are intelligent people who cherish vision, who love the mysterious, who look for the world of dreams and its fabled towers, the name of Nikola Tesla will remain among the true legends of the earth. See the glow retreats, now done is our day of toil. It yonder hastes new fields of life exploring. Oh, what wings can lift me from the soil? To follow, follow soaring.